let's have our last presentation and that's by anindo kishor mazumdar uh, anindo is a uvr specialist and very passionate about this sub subject uh, anindo please is my screen is visible sir am yes. i audible yes sure 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 uh, good evening to everybody all the esteemed speakers and the esteemed panelists and my heartfelt regards to AIOS and the scientific committee for giving me the opportunity to share my talk in this particular platform. Uh, I'm not a dry eye specialist, so I'm a little nervous and scared to give my talk in front of so many esteemed dry eye specialists. My apologies for if I'm doing any wrong in assessing the fear film or something, kindly give your inputs. I have nil financial interests. Uh, I'm coming to the case, a 26 year old female presented to my OPD with a sudden onset dimness of vision in the right eye. On examination, her basic visual acuity was pale only with a relative afferent pupillary defect in the right eye and left eye was normal for the age. Uh, her right eye showing a grade two SO reaction with a significant vitreous cells and an occlusive retinal vasculopathy with a gross capillary non-perfusion areas and a pale disc with a normal fundus in the left eye. She had a fever of uh, she had a history of fever, multiple joint pain, loss of weight, loss of appetite. Her investigation revealed a low hemoglobin with an increased creatinine, increased TSR, anti DS, antibody, anti DS DNA antibody positive. Preliminary examination had even cast with microhematuria. Renal biopsy revealed a glomerular sterosis. So we dealt with the patient of systemic lupus with nephropathy. We treated the patient along with the rheumatologist. The rheumatologist studied the patient with an IV cyclophosphamide, intravenous methyl prednisolone, along with an immunosuppressive therapy. Which, and we started treating the patient with topical steroid and cycloplegic, along with a fundus fluorescent angiography guided pan retinal photocoagulation. She had two to three recurrences in a year uh, in uveitis and developed a chronic uveitis. Her left eye was untouched by any inflammatory process. Gradually, she complained of redness, watering, foreign body sensation. This was the fundus photograph of the right eye which was showing a pale disc with sclerosis vessel and scattered hemorrhages. This is the fundus fluorescent angiography of the right eye showing a gross capillary non-perfusion areas. And this was a post PRP photograph of the right eye. This was the anterior photograph of the right eye showing evidence of chronic inflammation in the form of a broken sinechia. This was the tear film assessment under the slit lamp, showing a lower tear meniscus height, a very unstable tear film along with the tear debris. So I diagnosed uh, to be a case of the dry eye and I was compelled to send this patient to my cardiac colleagues. Coming to my next case, a 20 years old, 28 years old male patient presented with a history of recurrent TVITs in the right eye. He was complaining of pain, redness, and foreign body sensation in the right eye. His prescribed visual acuity was 6, 12, N6, where left eye was normal. On examination, he had a tender sterile nodule just adjacent to the inferior limbus and an adjacent delin like condition. He was found to be an anti nuclear antibody positive. This is a right eye color photograph showing a paralimbal tender in the nodule. On magnification, we can appreciate a social like the depression just adjacent to the nodule. This was the fluorescent staining pattern of the right eye. For the left eye, the patient was completely asymptomatic, but the fluorescent staining pattern of the left eye can be showing this much of irregularities. So I suspected dry eye and sent the patient to the dry eye clinic. If you look at the literature, you see that a Systemic lupus is a chronic multi-system autoimmune disease which involves skin, heart, kidney, brain, eye, blood, and lymphatic system, literally any system of the body. The incidence is almost 1,300 in one lakh patients, more seen in women. It's an autoimmune process where the body tissues are destroyed by autoantibodies against the components of the nuclei of a cell. The immune complex deposition mediated changes mainly plays a pivotal role in the pathogenesis, either for eye as well with the immune complex deposition in the blood vessels of conjunctiva, sclera, retina, choroid, and the basement membrane of the ciliary body and cornea, leading to vasculitis and thrombosis. The ocular involvement is seen almost one third of the patients with SLE in the form of lead dermatitis, keratitis, scleritis, secondary jogging syndrome, dry eye, 
retinal and parietal vascular lesions and neuroophthalmic complications. Coming to my next case, a 32 years old male presented to my OPD with an alternate unilateral severe non granulomatous uveitis. On examination, he had fibrin reaction in the right eye, having a characteristic postural difficulty, imaging shows. So imaging revealed sclerosis of the bilateral sacroiliac joint. It was found to be an intermediate positive disease. Actually, this spectrum is known as ankylosing spondylitis, presenting with a recurrent deviitis. In subsequent vis visits, he developed irritation and burning sensation. This was the anterior segment photograph of the right eye and the left eye. This was the fluorescent staining pattern of the right eye, showing a low tear meniscus side, very low tear breakup time and tear debris, whereas the left eye showing similar kind of picture with a very low tear meniscus height and an untear film instability as well as tear debris. So I suspected dry eye and sent the patient to my cornea colleagues. If you look at the literature, the dry eye is common in ankylosing spondylitis patients due to their tear film instability. The study revealed that there are either elevated levels of bublet cell loss or a squamous metaplasia leading to conjunctival, um, squamous met metaplasia of the conjunctival epithelium leading to this instability. Also, the prolonged use of topical steroids, insects, and different types of topicals along with preservatives causes surface toxicity. Uh, there are a list of surface uh, uh, preservatives. These are first generation preservatives. These are very toxic to the surface. The second generation preservatives relatively less toxic to the surface. There are a list of uh, newer generation preservatives. They decompose to less toxic substance like chloride and water on contact with the ocular surface and tears. So uh, they are relatively less toxic to the surface. The best is the unpreserved solutions uh, causes this toxicity, but they are actually expensive. Coming to my next case, a 23-year-old female presented to us with a redness, pain, and deepness of vision for two months. For both eyes, she has been diagnosed with a case of TVITs for six years and diagnosed as a case of sarcoidosis. Her base corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 6 by 24 N6 and left eye was 66 N6. This was the anterior segment of the photograph. This is a very, very angry eye. Patient was extremely symptomatic or is a diffuse congestion of the tall, deep epistolic vessels with the sternal edema, multiple in the nodules, there are even corneal scars, and a hypopan of almost two millimeter. This was a different segment in the photograph of the right eye, and this, this fundus was also, uh, the right eye was very the hazy, there was vitreous cells in both the eyes. So we made a provisional diagnosis of a sclerokeratoid uveitis in the right eye and left eye having an intermediate uveitis. On investigation, her complete blood count was normal. All basic collagen vascular workups was negative. The tubercular skin test as well as the IGRA was positive for uh, screening TB. Serum AIDS was normal. We rule out infection by doing an AC tap. PCR came negative for MTB, panfungal acid, as well as eubacterial genome. We did an HSCT chest, we revealed a parenchymal lymphoid fit with fibrotic strands and lymph node in the mediastinum, pre cardinal and hyaline lymph node. Uh, in 2011, the cervical lymph nodal biopsy in the showing uh, evidence of the granuloma in the background of a lymphoid cells, a probable diagnosis of sarcoidosis was made and patient used steroid for one year. And this time in 2013, we uh, saw the patient first. Pulmonologist made a diag um, diagnosis of latent tuberculosis and started the patient on antitubercular therapy along with uh, oral steroid, topical steroid, cyclopragic, and topical NSAID. Patient responded, pain was reduced, all the reactions were reduced. With two months, there was active expression of steroids again. This was the first recurrence in the photograph. We can the, appreciate the diffuse condition, sectoral congestion with the scleral edema. Patient was symptomatic with a severe pain. There's evidence of scleral thinning as well. We started the patient on azathioprine. Four months after starting the azathioprine, patient stopped the therapy, continued the low dose steroid. Even after four months, patient come back, came back with a very severe to the recurrence. At this time, the pain was not combated with steroid and azathioprine. We put the patient on intravenous methylprednisolone. And this was the presenting in the picture at that time. We can appreciate the deeper scleral condition. Patient was 
comfortable with post uh, with methyl prednisolone we completed the ATD stable for four months again after four months there were persistent focus of non necrotizing steroids and pain was classically increasing at night so we are dealing with a very recalcitrant type type of uh, steroids we got a little confused with what we miss here we can appreciate a very diffuse steroid in the congestion along with activity so we again uh, went back to the pulmonologist and sit back with the rheumatologist as well. We discussed the case we with the HSCT. There was cardiomegaly and medial steroid thickening. Again, we stick to the diagnosis for sarcoidosis. We put the patient on oral steroid, subcutaneous methotrexate along with doxycycline and uh, HCQS. Patient gradually stabilized with subcutaneous methotrexate over one year time. Right eye cataract surgery was to be done and patient was maintained on methotrexate for one year. In uh, COVID era, there was a gap in follow-up. So patient a few months back presented with an acute onset presentation with a scleral melt in the right eye. We referred uh, the patient urgently to the surface clinic under a scleral patch graft under steroid and immunosuppressive cover. And this is two months post-op in the picture where the full surface got epithelized, but patient is complaining of pain and irritation. So let us see how is the fluorescent staining pattern of the right eye. This was the fluorescent staining pattern of the right eye. You can easily appreciate the diffuse staining. Uh, the break of the time was with the low and patient hardly can open up the eyes in, in a bright light. So we refer back the patient to the surface clinic for a dry eye management. The, the association of scleritis in the system, it involves the vessels by resulting in deposition of circulating immune complexes in the superficial and deeper episcleritis in the vessels, which ultimately results in the shutdown of the episcleritis in the vasculitis in the bed, resulting in sloughing of necrosis and complications. Uh, in systemic association list, there are plethora of uh, diseases starting from rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis. I'm not uh, reading it, as we all know, and most of the diseases are primarily associated with dry eye. So coming to the sarcoidosis and dry eye, sarcoidosis is a disease which can affect literally any uh, system of the eye. On the surface, it has so many involvements, starting from conjunctiva to epistera to cornea to the lacrimal in the glands, leading to dry eye disease. Coming to my last case, is a six years old male presented to us with a chronic uveitis with hypertension and complicated cataract. So she, he was diagnosed with a case of juvenile idiopathic arthritis in a very early age and on disease modifiers like methotrexate and HCQS under the supervision of a rheumatologist. He underwent lensectomy, vitrectomy, and silicon oil injections and the GA. Patient remains symptomatic for a very long time. This is the anterior segment of the photograph. We can appreciate a uh, band shaped from the keratopathy. Uh, and an aphrakia, this is the staining the pattern of the, both the eyes. This is the patient was very symptomatic. You couldn't take the left eye in the video. The right eye is showing a significant TFL meniscus low height along with the TFL low breakup time and TFL debris. So looking at the literature, GIA again is the commonest systemic association of uveitis in childhood. It is usually insidious in onset presented in one to five years time. It presents with a chronic bilateral non granulomatous type of UVAs. Acute onset disease can be seen in an HLP27 positive group. Diagnosis is usually based on antinuclear antibody, the age of onset and duration of the pain and arthritis. The early onset disease, classically uh, ANA positive oligo oligoarticular GIA is the highest association and risk of developing chronic aridocyclitis. GIA is generally a diagnosis of exclusion from other causes of chronic arthritis. Usually the arthritis precedes the uveitis, but uveitis could be the presenting sign. If the cases are asymptomatic, they are generally diagnosed with late and coming up with a poor vision. The large number of cases are generally the diagnosis in idiopathic uveitis that requires a very thorough follow-up with the rheumatologist and a detailed tailored investigation and a careful combined approach. So my take home message is, devil is there, but that requires a clinical suspicion as well as management. The chronic disease needs more monitoring of the ocular surface. We never afford to 
overlook any clinical surface sign. We need timely referral of the patient to the specialist to prevent further complications and practice of preservative free operations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Onindo. And uh, that was a very, very elaborate discussion. In fact, uh, we put you at the end because you are dealing with two devils. <laughs> the, the devil of the uvea itself, uveitis itself, and the devil of the dry eye. So, uh, Chitra, any comments you would have? Uh, <clears throat> that was a wonderful talk. Uh, uh, really, I actually was planning to exit, but I just got caught up with uh, all that you said. So, it goes without saying that... Uh, all that you said is very valuable and uh, we need to always be on lookout for uh, dry status and treat them with as much vigor uh, along with all those uh, other chronic treatments which are needed for uveitis. I don't think uh, there's more to add on that. It is uh, The difficulty of the uveitis and especially as you said about the metaplasia changes that take place, the goblet cells becoming totally you know, defunct it makes it even more difficult for a chronic uveitis patient to uh, for a dry eye treatment. Is that not? Uh, Rishi, um, uh, you would have any comments on this? Um, no, I think it's a very good talk. And I think he's highlighted a few points uh, about the importance of uh, the ocular surface. Now, these patients are going to be on chronic therapy. Almost all the medicines that we're going to use are going to have preservatives. They're going to have uh, significant frequencies as well because if there's intraocular inflammation and then the use of NSAIDs, which would be imperative in, uh, in uh, deeper uh, inflammations of the eyeball, is actually bad news for the surface. So uh, NSAIDs, which would otherwise not be used, like we don't use NSAIDs at all uh, for our uh, dry eye patients. Uh, so, but here you don't have a choice. Uh, so you're going to be dealing with the, you know, the ketorolax and the diclofenax and the yes. fluvipropens going on to the ocular surface. So maybe uh, Dr. Nindya could tell us about how he would uh, sort of, you know, um, compromise these two uh, approaches. Uh, and would he rather use uh, preservative-free steroids? Uh, the only preservative-free ketorolax that was available has also been withdrawn now. Uh, which I think was Acular, uh, which used to come in that uh, little strip. So uh, I would be keen to hear from him because I'm sure he's got many more, ex much more experience than we do. Uh, I think uh, they have uh, now a lot on to immunosuppressives and biologics and those kind of treatments that mm -hmm. uh, I don't think NSAIDs they would be using much in UVA cases at all, I think. Maybe a comprehensive ophthalmologist might use, but a UVA specialist would have entirely, they might be using steroid drops at the most, which could uh, add, but I think the other medications would. No, I huh? think uh, they still, the still form, uh, still form um, the treatment, even when the active VITS has subsided, you know, you go on putting NSAs for at least three months so that the inflammation doesn't come back easier. Um, Aninda, you, you comment on that. Yes, sir. Means the topical NSAID has a very good role in uh, controlling or the maintenance of the inflammatory activity at, at the baseline. And it has been uh, so many of the publication also have for the use of uh, different kinds of topicals in the NSAID. But the, it's a double as it should. Like if we lose the grip of the inflammatory disease, we'll say uh, inflammatory sin. Uh, you, you can inject or you can have a system uh, medication or an immunosuppressive which is taking care of the disease process itself. But along with that, a topical insect is always contributory in reducing the risk of recurrence of those inflammatory CMS. In those cases, we really have to continue with the topical insect. But along with that, we also have a close monitoring of the ocular surface, whether we are lining up with any kind of toxicity. Naren, any short comments and before we end, Sonu and uh, KP is also there. Any short comments from any of you? Uh, uh, I, I believe that I think def definitely dry eye workup is extremely, extremely important. Yeah. Always look at the eyelids. 
look at the eyelashes that that is i think you know we need to go step by step i mean what happens in medical school we are taught then over time we just forget it and we just simply go ahead i think that is not to be forgotten it is very important to look at every part before we go inside and look inside and uh, because half the clues are right there uh, bang on your face and it is easily missed out when the patient complains post surgery they then you start looking for it so i feel uh, that is uh, that is a key message that every surgeon has been telling uh, in every uh, everyone uh, talk i feel that is the take home message right. thank you thank sonu kp Okay. Everything has been said. <laughs> oh, whatever has been said, as everything has been said, right? So I think thank you very much. Uh, thanks for, to all of you, to the speakers, to the panelists, and uh, it's been a very nice discussion. Uh, I'm sure the, the Facebook numbers are going up. <laughs> I was just looking at that, and it's been a very good discussion with all the multi specialities involved. And uh, thank you very much for being with us, and from the whole team of uh, scientific committee. Thanks, Rishi. Thanks, Chitra. Thanks, Anindo. Thanks, uh, Narin. And, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Good night.